Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So on today's show, we have Judy Hoberman, and she was absolutely amazing. Andressa, right? Yeah, we need about two or three more interviews with her to get all my questions out. She's a, she's a rock star. She is, uh, she's an international speaker, trainer, coach. She's written a bunch of books all around uh, empowering women, especially in the sale, selling and leadership arenas. Uh, I, I really enjoyed our interview. I wrote like three pages of notes, to be honest with you, ladies. But what, <laughs> I, what I think stood out most to me is the, the power of asking for referrals. So that's a traditional term like in selling, but how it relates to us investors, it's, it's endless, but really, really empowering ourselves to ask for what we need to, mm -hmm. you know, from people who are already working with. So whether it's the home mother, homeowner, whether it's the banker, whether it's the, you know, investor, whether it's our private lender, whoever that is, but I really think there's such power in asking, right? Proactively for what we want. Yes. Absolutely. She, always ta she also talks about that in sales, sales is a conversation, first of all, and it's not about you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's actually a good thing that it's not about you. So instead of being interesting, be interested on what the other person has to say, getting other person's world and really making that connection. She's a powerhouse in sales and leadership. And I do believe you will benefit from listening to this episode. Enjoy. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Invest Her Show. We are so excited to have Judy Hoberman with us on this week's show. So welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and have a conversation with you ladies. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about jumping in to her story and love the name of her book. She'll go through that a little bit later and all that good stuff we're going to talk about. Um, but we, before we go there, just you know, want to thank the ladies listening. Thank you for listening. We know how valuable and sacred time is these days, especially as, oh, yes. especially as the fall is almost upon us and Everyone has so many things pulling at their attention. So thank you, you know, the women listening, thank you for taking the time to connect with us and uh, please keep sending us feedback. If you have ideas for the show, ideas for the women that we interview, uh, ideas for our mini-sodes where we just do a 10-minute little, little stint around something that's try we're trying to be of value to you, let us know. Uh, TheRealEstateInvestor.com is our website and just shoot us an email and we get those directly and we would love to hear from you. So I, I do want to mention that. We're all ears. Uh, so with that, we like to kind of get connected to all of you and hear what's going on. So Andressa, what, what is going on? How are you doing? Doing well, very well. Today, I want to talk about something that I saw this week. And I don't know where because sometimes we see different things and, and a couple of things catch my eye and some don't. But this one, I don't know if you heard of this before it's a story about michael jordan uh in a game that he had a flu and he played even though he had a uh 103 um fever hmm. have you heard of this before i haven't so he played and he played very very well so this guy was talking about when we have something very important to for us to attend, to be at, usually it takes a, a toll on our health and days before or the day of, we get very sick and, and we can't perform mentally. So he was saying that Marco Jordan was a very specific um, example of how to overcome that. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know, Liz, if you remember the day that I had an interview with Bigger Pockets. I, I know it's very different perspective, but my interview with Bigger Pockets, I had such a bad cough. Mm. I couldn't speak without coughing a hundred <laughs> times in a row. So I got coffee drops. I got the spray that you numb everything, multiple things at the same time. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. 
I mm. imagine in an interview that you were coughing at all times. And I remember that I spray, spray, spray a lot. And I went to the interview and I didn't think about the cough. I didn't think about coughing or having the desire because I was in that zone. And I believe that that's what happens with people. The mindset takes over. If it is that strong, it mm. takes over and you just execute and it kind of overcome your physical. So everything that we do in life, I know that it's sometimes our health goes second and we are not 100% ready to go. And I'm not saying for you to just respect your body and not be, you know, conscious and kind with yourself. All I'm saying is that if you find your zone, you can get very easy through anything. A GC, a deal that went wrong, you know, a tenant that is giving you a hard time. The mindset will carry you through. Yeah. That's very powerful. And you hear so much with Michael Jordan around how many times he's failed, which we all know it's like a lot of times, whatever that number is, <laughs> yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. But you're right. It, that's an interesting perspective uh, to, to also think about and move through it. And that's not yeah. always easy. Yeah. I like that. I yeah. like that. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, speaking of mindset, I mean, you know, I'm really excited to have you on, Judy, on our show here today. Uh, obviously, you know, this, is, this show is all about helping women create financial freedom and create a balanced life. And uh, obviously, it's geared towards real estate investing. But I, I want to ask the question to you about your path, how you got started and what you're up to. And, and, and Judy is a, a phenomenal resource when it comes to selling, which is such an important skill when it comes to really anything, but especially in real estate, investing and selling yourself, selling ideas. You're the expert, not me. So I'm going to have you introduce yourself more so answer the question, how did you, what propelled you to get involved really with this, you know, being a thought leader when it comes to selling, not only when it comes to selling, but for women selling and being effective mm -hmm. in that strategy. So mm -hmm. we'd love to hear that. So I actually started my official career. I mean, I was a Girl Scout and I was the number one cookie girl, just let me say. Oh. <laughs> but, the, but there's a reason I say this. The reason I was successful is because I remembered what people bought the year before. And I came back and I said, so last year you bought, you know, you bought uh, Thin Mints. Would you like those again? Or would you like to see the new? cookies, you know, whatever. So I was the number one for many years in a row. And I remember that only because if you listen to what your people tell you, you're going to do well in sales because sales is nothing more than a conversation and a relationship. But when I started, um, my first real job seriously was in construction. And I was the only female in the state of Connecticut that was in commercial uh, roofing of all things. Wow. And so when I was doing the roofing, I was climbing up a ladder and I was doing all the things that you would think women don't do. But the truth of the matter was I was selling myself. And I don't mean that, you know, figuratively and literally. Sure. I'm just saying that I had to sell what the company was. I was the face of the company. But my real um, substantial career was in insurance. And you know as well as I do, insurance could be very boring and it's not tangible and you can't smell, feel, taste or anything else. You have to actually provide a solution. And so for me, again, I was the only female and I had to do things a little bit differently because I had these tremendously successful male mentors. The problem was you can only do so much as somebody that isn't like you can do, and then you have to take it on yourself. And so when the men would say to me, get in, get out and get the check, I would be like, yeah, but you can't do it like that. You have to have a relationship. And so they would tell me, they would criticize me. I was such a girl. I asked too many questions. You know, everybody had to be my friend. My appointments were too long. I came back, all that kind of nonsense. And all I kept thinking was, it's a relationship. It's a relationship. So as I got more successful, they realized that selling like a girl was really a compliment, not being, you know, something that was nasty. Mm -hmm. And they started watching me and they started seeing things. So as I progressed, I ended up with three agencies of my own. And then I was recruited to, um, to be in a big company to do their training in their uh, universities and everything like that. What happened there was the, the, culture was very toxic. And so I left. And when I left, I was a female that was not 20 years old. I was a female that wasn't married. I was a female that supported herself. I was a female that had these, the, a huge salary and I jumped. 
I didn't even think about it. I jumped. And so I started my own company selling in a skirt. And what that really was, was about women in sales. Like what is sales all about? It's nothing more than a conversation, but it's also about how to work with the men that actually are around you. And you think about real estate, while uh, residential real estate is primarily women, because you look at any of the companies, it's all women, but you go into commercial, it's mostly men. Yeah. When you go into leadership, it's mostly men. When you go into investing, it's mostly men. Or that's who you see anyway. So how do you work with men to make things happen? How do you communicate with them? And that's really how it all started. Wow. I have so many questions <laughs> in my head right now. <laughs> right. So, so for the ladies out there, there is this perception, right? The, um, a lot of folks have about sales that mm -hmm. I don't want to force anything. I don't want to, when I'm buying something, I don't want to offend the seller. I don't want to make him feel bad. Therefore, I don't negotiate the, 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 the sale or I don't have a conversation, as you mentioned before. So all those perceptions and fears and stories around it, how can the ladies that are listening that do not have sales experience but are starting investing in real estate right now or already doing it but they're not where they want to go to be at, um, how they can overcome those stereotypes and fears? Well, first of all, everybody's in sales. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what anybody. You're selling yourself every single day. That, I mean, that's first and foremost. So you have to get used to being who you are. And sometimes you, it, I do like a little exercise with people. Where I'll say, ask the person you trust the most to describe you in three words. And then you describe yourself in three words and see if they match, because sometimes if they don't match, then the perception of somebody else is really becomes a reality and it's not what you want it to be. Mm. Okay. Mm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is understand that you have a solution for someone, whether you are the investor or the investee, whether you are the realtor or you're the buyer, whatever it is, you have a solution, but you're not going to get there until you start asking questions. And you don't ask the question is, is this building for sale? How much is it? You're going to get all that. So when I was selling insurance, I would never say to somebody, do you want insurance or how much do you want to pay? I would say to them, tell me why it's so important to have this policy in place. Well, guess what happens? They tell you everything, including their why. Once you get their why, there's the conversation. They, and in that conversation, they tell me how much they want to spend and what they want to do and, and who the benefit. They tell me everything, but I never ask the question. My question is always an open-ended question that gets them as part of the conversation. Mm. And that's really what it is. So whether you love sales, you don't have love sales, whether you, you know, picture it as a slimy thing and you don't want to really be doing it, don't do so. Stop selling. There's your first piece. Stop selling. Have a conversation. Do your research. If you're buying a building and it's, you know, you, whatever you want to do with it, find out what it was. Find out who was in it before. Ask some questions about it. If you want to get an investor to come in and invest in your building, in your business, find out what they've done. What have they done in the community? What is something special? What award did they win? And talk about it. Have the conversation. Do your homework. So for me, sales is nothing more than a conversation. And, and I mean, I've, I've, and I, I don't want to say convinced, but I have actually shown people that the person that hates the sales the most, selling the most, is the best salesperson. Because they don't want to have that. They don't right. Want to, right? So yeah. that's what they're doing. They turn it around and they, they have a conversation. I say be interested in someone, not interesting to someone. Mm. Oh, I like that. Say that again, Judy. Just be interested, not interesting. So you're interested yeah. in someone, not interesting to someone. I mean, I could tell you great stories. I could tell you funny stories. I could tell you amazing stories, but they're not relevant. You know what I mean? If that's I tell a great, you a story, point. it's because it's relevant to the conversation. Um, and I am a shiny object girl. I can go off on a million things and come right back. But I've learned you have to you have to really, you know, hone it in. And when I said to you about the three words, this is and I'm going to I'll tell the story because this is a true story about what happened and how perception becomes a reality. When I started my company, the first thing I did was I'm a speaker. So I would go to all these speaking engagements and I would show up and no one, and I mean, no one, I'm talking about zero, no one would talk to me till after I spoke. No wow. one, no one. 
And so I thought, well, you know, that's kind of weird. You know, after five or six times, I thought something's going on. So I randomly did that exercise. And I went up to people and I'd say, so why don't you talk to me beforehand? And every person, nobody was together. It was all separate. These are the three words that, that they described me. I was intimidating, unapproachable, and above their level. Oh, my goodness. I went into my car and started to cry. And I wow. thought, how could people think of me like that? That's not me at all. Mm. And so I had to go back and see what was I putting off that made them think like this. So one day I wore a pair of really crazy boots and I'm a boot person and a woman started talking to me and I had to think to myself, did I already speak because she's talking to me? That's, <laughs> that's what went in. And wow. so, and then another person, another person. So the next time I spoke, the same thing happened. So I became an athlete. Like they don't change their underwear. I didn't change my boots. <laughs> and so then I did the, the exercise again and I said, Okay, when you when you see me or when you hear me, what do you think of? And they said, you're funny, you're approachable, you're awesome, you're a thought leader, blah, blah, blah. So I realized I'm an introvert. When I walk into a room of people that I don't know, I don't necessarily start a conversation. So mm. I had to change that. And that's what I'm saying. You have to really see if how people describe you, if they think that you are, you know, you're a slimy salesperson, what are you doing that's making them think that? So that's why I always say, if you do that and you get that in your head and you start to see, whoa, that's really who I am. Well, that's really who I'm not. Perception becomes a reality. That's so true though, because I am an introvert as well. And, and I, can, I am thinking about when I go to events and I speak, that happens. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to start wearing funny boots too. <laughs> Just be something that's you. I mean, my, my, you know, I wear boots and I usually wear a leather jacket. That's my trademark. Now it wasn't. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. Something. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you could wear the, your glasses are really cool. So yes. maybe, maybe it's glasses and it doesn't yeah. matter. There's people that wear a color. They wear red all the time or they wear blue or whatever it is. They, they know how you're going to show up. So what's that perception? I think that's a great point. I, I love, I have so many questions too, as a follow-up. I, I, I want to just mention that I love the idea of, tr you know, we always, we always know, we always been asked, you know, ask people a few, quite, few things to describe you, but I love the idea of actually matching it with how you see yourself. That's the missing piece. That's right. So, and I love that because, you know, it's one thing to get it, but then really what, how would you describe yourself? Or how do you want that? Where, how do you want to be perceived? And does that right. match? If it doesn't, that's your first homework assignment. So I love that. I think that's a great, great, great point. Um, I want to circle back to Judy, when you mentioned about, uh, you know, you know, the woman listening, you know, they're, they're either scaling their, their portfolio, they're looking to buy more, they're, they're, or they're looking to jump in, right? It's usually one of the two. And we have women all across the board who, who really are part of our invest her community and, and, you know, trying to grow our wealth, but also do it in a sane, you know, peaceful way. I'm curious, what do you find to be the biggest mistakes that women make when it comes to speaking and influencing men? Because you got the contractors, obviously that's a huge uh, thing to overcome or area to overcome for a lot of women, uh, you know, and also commercial brokers, if they're looking to get into larger buildings, uh, you know, or like our friend Pam, you know, she's selling land, um, apartment buildings, uh, office buildings. This is male oriented. Residential side, single family homes. Okay, a little more women, women uh, oriented or women focused. But so what would you say are the biggest mistakes that women make? So one of the biggest mistakes, and this is true with any industry, any industry with women, women want to help everyone. They don't want to leave anybody out. Oh well, no, really? <laughs> yeah. So the first thing, the first thing I always tell people is who's your market? Yeah. Okay. So even it doesn't matter if you're going to sell or buy or whatever it is in, in, in investing in, in commercial real estate, who's your market? Who are the people that you speak the same language with? Who are the people you're comfortable with? They'll, tr they'll inter uh, introduce you to other people, but the truth of the matter is you have to start somewhere. So who are your people? That's know your people because that's what's going to help you start or become even better. The second thing is you have to be able to stand out. How many commercial realtors are there? How many investors are there? How do you stand out? So how do you stand out? You become the expert in your field. So if I said to you that my market, now I'll go into insurance again. My market were contractors. That's what my market was. Because when we started out, we didn't have computers. They would give you the yellow pages and rip it apart and hand you, here's yours, here's yours. And my very first time they gave it to me were contractors. Mm -hmm. So I was in charge of working with contractors. 
And so I would call every single one and listen to every single story they would tell me, no, I don't need it. No, I don't want it. No, 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 no. And then somebody would say yes. And so I would go and I would see them and I would become, and I did become the expert in construction contractors. That's who, that's where I became. And so when they would say something to me, I mean, I always had pads with me and I would write things down because I wanted to hear in their own words, what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. So when I would come back to them and say, okay, so when you told me X, Y, and Z, here it is. And so whatever I said I would do, I did. So there's the other piece of it. When you promise something, you better be delivering. You can't say, I'm going to have it to you by tonight. And then it doesn't show up because that's a pretest for people. So that's the second part is know your, you have to know your people and you have to make sure that you are standing out in some way. So again, contractors, I knew them. How I stood out was I prom whatever I promised, I delivered. Okay. And then the third thing is you have to be willing to ask for referrals because that's the mistake people make. I don't want to ask. And what if they say no? Well, who cares? What's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say, I don't know anybody. But my, bu my business, now remember, yellow pages, that's not really considered a lead. Those are <laughs> yellow pages. Okay. But after 30 days of working with contractors, I met many centers of influence. I never, ever, after 30 days, had to have yellow pages again. My business was 100% referrals. Wow. And the way that they introduced me was, she does what she says. She shows up when she promises. She makes the call when she does. She services our, you know, our people. Whatever it was, whatever they asked for. I mean, you can't be available 24-7. So that's the other mistake people make is I'm available 24-7. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. So, so, you know, you can't help everybody. You have to be able to stand out. You're not available. You have to have some kind of boundaries. So that, that's what I would say. Yeah. And I think the asking for referrals is so applicable, mm -hmm. right? So if you have someone you were, you know, you're meeting with a homeowner and, you know, you're buying their home and you've, you know, you've figured out whether you're buying it and holding it or you're flipping it, whatever exit strategy doesn't really matter, but you're meeting with them, you're building a relationship. What a great opportunity to like, hey, do you have any neighbors that you know they're going through similar things or what have you? I mean, a referral it can look so like so many different things. It's not just like, hey, I need a referral because people don't even know what that means. I wouldn't even use that word, right? right. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's who jargon. Do you know? Who, do yeah, you know? who do you know? Kind of and, thing. And the other thing is, you're right. When somebody is selling the house or you're buying their house or whatever, guess what are they doing next? One person in real estate could be a hundred transactions because somebody's buying and then they have a child and then they have a sister and then they have a cousin. Oh, by the way, my, my brother owns a building over here. My sister has an apartment building. Could you do this? Could you? All you have to do is build that relationship. And people are afraid of asking for a referral because they think it's going to mess up that relationship. It isn't. The worst they're going to say to you is no. You will not die from somebody saying no to you. You go, okay, they're not my people. I'm going to move along. That's what I always say. In my head, it's like, okay, they're not my people. Move along. Not my people. Move along. Oh, there's my people. But and I, I love that. You do have to ask. And I think sometimes, and I can just speak personally, I was in sales for many years and I used to think, well, if they really wanted to refer me or give me someone, they would. But then I, I remember talking with someone too, Judy, just like you're saying, and they're like, Liz, do you really think they wake up? every morning thinking about how they can help Liz Faircloth. That's I'm right. like, well, when you put it like that, you know, she's like, it's true. No one, everyone doesn't wake up thinking how they're going to help this one person in their world unless they're asked. And if they like and respect you, of course, they're going to say, hey, I have this or that. But we have to remember we're all in our own world. So people aren't thinking about you every day <laughs> or every moment of the day unless you, I mean, how are we connected with you, Judy? We, right. we, we know someone in common, Pam. Hey, Pam, can you introduce me? She, she would be like, hey, I'm happy to help. We have a nice relationship. She, she's building one with you. But she's not waking up like every day. Who can she introduce? <laughs> to our, I mean, because everyone's got their own world. And I think we have to remember that as people and as women. Um, not, you know, we just have to put ourselves out there and not always think, well, if they wanted to refer us, they would. Well, may, they may not even be thinking about that. <laughs> because sometimes they'll say to you, oh, I didn't even think of that. Wait, right. how about that? And so when you put that in their head, all of a sudden they're saying, well, let me open up my mental Rolodex and say, okay, right. so let me introduce this. Let me do this. Let me do that. Now, sometimes I will say to somebody, how can I support you? Who do you need to meet? Mm. Now, two things will happen. Three things happen. One, they'll say, I don't know right now but can I keep that open? One will say, yes, could you introduce me to Liz Faircloth? Or one will say, 
in, uh, everybody's my market, introduce me to everyone. And that's when my curtain goes down because I can't mm -hmm. see everyone. I have to see mm -hmm. who you're talking about. If you said, I only want to meet teachers, I can see teachers. If I, on I only want to meet people in uh, real estate that are residential um, realtors, I can see that. But when you don't give me anything, I can't. So that's the other thing. Like everybody's my market. Yeah, I can help. Every nobody can help any. I don't care if you're selling water or oxygen. Not everybody <laughs> needs it. Right. That's what I'm saying. So it, it's it's a it's a real big myth in sales. I can help everyone. Everyone's my market. Mm -hmm. No. And I also think it's, it's part of uh, building that muscle, right? I did door to door sales and there were many processes and um, the referral was the, the last piece and you got to check that box, but it got to the point that it was kind of almost like automatic and natural to ask for it in a very ongoing and simple way, because it was just part of part of the process. Oh, do you know anybody else over here that I can also help uh, family members? They always say, oh, yeah, Joe and, and Judy over there. And then you go and talk to them by their names or can you give them a call and then we can see if it, that's a good time for me to stop by or so there's so many ways that we can really tie it up, but it comes down to what you're saying about building a relationship in a way that you, you find yourself very comfortable having that conversation. Yeah. And your uniqueness, your your strengths, your 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 accent, whatever makes you different is gonna show up. One thing that I was reading on your uh, bio, you said that your mission is to help one woman a day by following an important philosophy. Women want to be treated equally, not identically. Mm -hmm. That like when a light bulb went on. What do you mean by that? So first, the first half of it is helping one woman a day, because that has always been my mission. And when I say that, there are people that either will say, well, what about 10,000 women a day? What about a million women a day? If you help one woman a day exponentially, there's millions, okay? I want to help one woman. And when I would say that, the second part would be there'd always be a woman that would raise her hand and say, can I be your woman? Which is very humbling because women don't usually ask for help. Yes. So it was a very easy way to get people to ask for help. The second is my tagline, women want to be treated equally, not identically. And what that simply means is give us the same opportunity. We don't want to be men. We don't want to act like men. We don't want to speak like men. We don't want to do the same things men do. If yes. you give us the same opportunity, let us do it. That's all. So it means, you know, open up a door for us. Now, when you talk about investing and you know that it's, you know, really heavily male dominated, what if you became good friends with another investor and they knew that there was something coming up and it, either they didn't have the time, the money or the interest? Why wouldn't they say to you, hey, there's something coming up. I think it would be you'd be a great fit for it. Why don't you look at that? That's all it is. Open up a door to let us know an opportunity, even be a mentor for us that you can say, here's how it looks. You know, you're going to have some bumps in the road. Here's how it's going to look. We're not going to do it for you, but let me show you what could happen. That's all it is. We just want to be treated the same. We want to have the same opportunities as men have, but we don't want to be treated like men. Does that that's make sense? Clear. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. clear. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's a really interesting perspective because I think in a lot of ways what we've been, you know, people will say, why do you interview just women? And what yeah. is, you know, I'm like, this is not about men bashing or segregation. It, this is, yeah, at all. It's really just to empower women. That's what we're right. kind of in the business of, or at least, you know, what we're up to in terms of our, our passion here in terms of combining this idea of financial freedom investing with focusing on supporting women because we have different challenges and issues that I can't speak about what men have to deal. I'm not a man. So, right. you know, you know, so ultimately, uh, obviously, so, you know, ultimately you're trying to empower, not alienate. And I think what you just said makes complete sense. So, you know, w with, with women in leadership and women leading their investing companies and their investments, you know, we hear so much about leadership and most women will think, oh, I don't have a big team or I don't have a big company, but everyone's hiring VAs to support volunteers to, um, to an admin or to just someone who's helping you with one particular issue, especially with Upwork. We're all hiring people for different things. So we're all leaders ultimately, and we're even leaders of ourselves. So I don't buy into you're not leaders. 
and we haven't really explored this. It's a big passion of mine and my other, my corporate work I used to do, but I'm, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear your philosophy and thoughts on what actions can women take to be come the leader they already are because that's what i would even say you know even if women don't believe that i would say they are a leader that but there might be a gap of how they see themselves and how they're connecting with the world like you kind of mentioned earlier so what have you found in the work you've done because clearly you know you have a lot of um i'm sure great suggestions around this so as women are developing their own self around leadership their own leadership skills what are some musts they have to do to become really the leader that they know they they are well, you're, you're 100% correct that women are already a leader. Actually, everybody's already a leader. You just have to decide how much of a leader you want to be. So mm -hmm. sometimes people will say, I want to you know, change the world. Well, is that the world globally or is that your immediate world? Because there's a big difference there as well. So you have, to, you, know, you have to be a little bit more specific in what you're trying to do. And as a leader, I would say that you have to look into yourself and see what kind of qualities you have that are already there that maybe you're not using. Like, you know, in my book on walking on the glass floor, it's all about skills. And one of the skills that I think that women take for granted or people take for granted about women is generosity. And as a leader, you have to be generous, whether it's generous with giving, you know, it could be like setting up a, you know, crowdfunding for somebody, or it could be investing in something, or you invest in your people. Okay. And the best way to invest in your people that don't, that doesn't cost anything, but your time is giving your time. So you have to be generous. And that's very big with leadership because I know for a fact that when somebody says, oh, I'm really too busy, that again, not your people. And that's about priorities. So that's when I say I help one woman a day, there's generosity because I really believe that if I can help one woman, if I can sit down and look at your business in 15 minutes, I can see things you don't see only because I'm not as close as you are to your business. And so I always do that when I speak or something, I say, you know, let me have 15 minutes laser focus time with your business and I'll give you a suggestion on your biggest challenge or whatever it is. Mm. So the first one is generosity. The second thing that I think is huge for women is courage. Okay. We make very difficult decisions and you have to be able to be courageous about some of the things that you're going to do, whether it's jumping into a new market or whether it's jumping into something that you have no idea what you're talking about, but then you have to learn about it. So you can't just be courageous and say, okay, I'm going to do this and I did it and I jumped in and now here I am. No, you have to also be able to talk, your, you know, walk your walk and talk your talk. So again, when I say standing out, you have to become the expert. So there's all these different ways of showing that you're a leader. Now, one of the easiest things are, that people can do and probably should do is write. You can write a blog post. A blog post is 500 words. 500 words is like, you know, you can do it in a minute because there's, you can say a lot and 500 words will pour out. So um, I, I do a lot of, um, I'm a contributing author um, to a lot of different magazines. They have nothing to do with what I do, nothing, but they want my perspective about women in their industries. Mm. Okay, so my name is out there a lot on all different things. I write for CU Insight in and uh, Annuities Outlook. I, that, that's not necessarily who I am, but if I give a female perspective according to their industry, my name is out there. I speak a lot. So a lot of the things that you can do to be a thought leader is to at least start writing because a lot, a lot of people don't want to be speaking. But if you can write, you know, even even write your own blog posts and put it out there on social media on a consistent basis, because people will start seeing your name and they'll start saying, "Ooh, I want to know more about her. I want to know what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you have to come up with this amazing information all the time. You, there's so many websites you can go to that you can pull content like all top A L L T O you go there it's like a, a clearinghouse for all things that come up real estates on there um, all different pieces and you you make a comment about that particular article we have a site called the report for women.com and I don't know if you know what the Drudge Report is, but a Drudge Report is also like a clearinghouse for like a million different things. The report for women is only about industries that women are involved in. Real estate's mm -hmm. a big one. Again, mm -hmm. you go in, you click on the, the, I mean, it's free to subscribe. You go in, you click on the article, comment on the article. That's what it, so you can do, you can make two sentences and say, I just read this article by Judy Hoberman and blah, 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 blah. And here's what she said. Here's what I think. Boom. So as a, as a leader, you have to start getting your, yourself out there 
so other people will follow you. You have to give people a reason to follow you. They're not just going to wake up in the morning, like you said about referrals. They're not going to wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to follow this Claire Cloth today. That's what I'm going to do. How do they know you? So that's what it, and it's consistency. It's got to be consistency because leadership is, is, is a lot more than a title. Just because Absolutely. you have a title, I mean, it means nothing. Yeah. And, and it, for, piggybacking on what you're saying about the courage to even express, because um, on our meetups around the country, we are, we are, we, our goal is and will always be to have a safe place where women can raise their hand and ask questions mm -hmm. and express their thoughts. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable doing that anywhere else. So we feel that it's a, a changing of habits. So they feel more comfortable expressing themselves. It, in regards to the blog or a post, there is a, a lack of confidence instead of saying, oh, I did X, Y, and Z deals. What we hear is, I only did five deals and I am not an expert yet into it. So when I do I don't know, X amount of deals or when I have X amount of years of experience, then I will become an expert on it. And, uh, and I, I don't think that that's what you're. No, no. And in fact, you know, when I have, if I do, when I get, those are all the things that we tell ourselves. That's the internal chatter that we have. And yes. you, have to, you have to rewind those tapes because it's ridiculous. Nobody cares what you have or don't have. And I'm not saying to say, I just had, I had five deals. I'm not saying that at all. You can talk about something like, for instance, let's say you were looking at property in the Bahamas and we all see what happened in the Bahamas yesterday and, and probably today as well. You know, you can talk about making sure you have protection for your, your building. Okay. It has nothing to do with what you are personally doing or selling or not selling or how many people you were in front of. You talk about a, a conversation, a topic that people in your industry would be interested in. Again, remember interested, not interesting. Mm -hmm. If you were talking about an apartment building and you are in this new, this area that everything is coming up and everything is being redone and it's amazing. Talk about how, what it's like to be, um, go through regent regentification, like what that means to people. So you do topics like that. Like we would never have done a topic like, is life insurance what you need? We would, we would say, you know, <laughs> or, or when we were recruiting women, you know, uh -huh. you couldn't just say, I want women to do life insurance. It wasn't that. We would say, can a woman have it all? Well, guess what? All, every woman read it. Every woman would want to be part of it because it had nothing to do with saying you should be in this industry or you should buy life insurance. It wasn't that at all. We did a topic. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. You know, and a lot of times yeah. like in, in insurance, we had compliance. So you could not talk about a product in real estate. You don't have the compliance hanging over your head. You have other things, but it's not the compliance issue. So you could talk about mortgage rates or you could talk about whatever. But even that is not as interesting as where would you be in five years if you had bought Apple stocks today? You know, it, it's that kind of mindset, like change, yeah. the, change the format of it. And it's not about you. Remember that in sales, it's not about you. Take, your, take the spotlight off you. It's not about you. People don't care about you yet because they don't know who you are. So it's about what it is that you can do for them. So when you give them great content, then they're able to say, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe this article I just read. It's the best thing ever. I love that, Judy. And I think the biggest, I, I think the biggest thing that I have come to realize in speaking with a lot of women and a lot of men for that matter, is that they get themselves out there on social media and then they come back and go, you know what? I'm just not getting the leads to buy the new property or for new investors or fill in the blank. And really what's happening is they have not identified their market, like who they really, who do they want to respond to that post? So right. with social media, they're like, I should just be, you know, in, in drones, just getting everyone, like, you got to really get clear on that. And I love what you said, because I think that's the biggest, that's the hard work. It's really easy sometimes when people have been doing this, like, I can tell you a little bit about X, Y, and Z, but okay, great. But are you adding value to the people you want to be attracting? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest question. And Absolutely. where are those people, you know, and, and those women, those men, and then how do you get in front of them and give them good content, like you're saying, of value? Yeah. Um, I love that. And yeah. Judy, so in my head, the question that might be going through other women's head too, is that 
how can I identify it? I am, I have different shiny objects around me and I'm getting distracted. And I have a lot of things that I like and that I enjoy and that I see potential. So how can I narrow down and focus and really serve the market? How can I determine the market? So first of all, you have to know the difference between a priority and a distraction, okay? Because there's lots of distractions out there. Oh, that looks good. Oop, that looks good. And that looks good. Okay, so now you say, all right, but where do I really want to be? Picture this as a sandbox. Who is in your sandbox? Who do you want to be playing with? Now, you can say, well, I want everybody to come into my sandbox. No, you don't. Because there are people that you don't want to do business with. And I can guarantee anybody that's listening can already tell you who they don't want to do business with. Yes. <laughs> this person is this, this person is slimy, this person said nasty things, this person doesn't like, whatever, they're not your people. And you have to keep sifting through that sandbox and saying, okay, who is my people? Who are my people? So the first thing you have to do is decide who is going to be with you long-term. Mm. So when you're investing, you have to decide, am I doing buildings? Am I doing you know, uh, land? What, what do I really want to do? And then say, where are my people? Because everybody goes somewhere. You have to find the people. So do they network somewhere? Do they congregate? Are there events that are specifically for those people? And the second half of it is, who are my strategic partners? So if I was in real estate and I was residential, my strategic partners would be mortgage, title, anybody that's in banking. And I would also have commercial because commercial does get leads for residential and vice versa. I would also do investors. So now back it up. I'm an investor. So who are my people? Who are my strategic partner? A strategic partner is somebody who's already in your space, but they complement you, not compete with you. Mm. Okay. So when I did insurance, we did um, heavily underwritten health insurance. Oh, all the other insurances too, but our insurance was heavily underwritten, which means the major portion of the population could not get our regular plan. However, in my back pocket, I had people that had less regulated. I had people that did, you know, highly, um, the people that had, were high risk. I had all of those people. I also had property casualty because we didn't have that. So I had those people in my back pocket. So if I was talking to you and you told me all these things and I said, you know what? I may not be able to cover you, but I do have somebody that can. And so I would have my strategic partner come in. That's what I'm saying. So you have to know, yeah, you don't want now. And that doesn't mean like if I chose that I only want to do business with, you know, people that are selling land. It doesn't mean that if somebody came up and said, hey, I've got a building that I want to sell. Do you want to be my realtor? It doesn't mean you're going to say no. It just means you don't look for them first. You're looking for your market first. It doesn't mean eliminate everybody, but concentrate. Sure. So you become the expert in that space. So when they know, when they're going to you know, sell land or buy land, whatever, they're calling you first. You've got you know, stuff that's written. You've spoken at different places. People know you. You've got great referrals, te great testimonials, which is another thing. Always ask a person to give you a testimonial, written or video, throw it on your website. Because people go to your website and they look and they see. You know, I always, and I have that, I have on my website, but I also have like a file on my computer. So when things are really like so bad that, you know, I can't even get arrested, that's how bad it is. I have a file. <laughs> I, I have a file and I, and I either listen, watch or read testimonials because then I come back right back to, okay, that's why I'm doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a good day because no matter who you are, no matter what level you're at, there's that day mm -hmm. or that week. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, why am I doing this? Yep. So that's, that's the other thing I do. Yeah. Love that. Um, Judy, we could probably keep asking you a million questions here. I love what you're saying. And I just love what you're putting out there because I think it's so, it's so important and it really, it moves through so nicely women, men, it's just like gets to the root cause of helping regardless who you are, what you are, get to selling more. And that's what really, you know, I know you, you're really passionate about. So where can the ladies listening and, you know, learn more about what you're up to, uh, find the book, the, the resources you have, the books. I know you have a radio show that's growing tremendously. So how can they reach out? So you can go to my website, which is sellinginaskirt.com. I also have a second one, which is walkingontheglassfloor.com. So you can go to either or. One is more leadership, one is more sales. Um, you can email me at judy at sellinginaskirt.com. I answer my own emails. Nobody does that for me. 
Um, you, I mean, you can follow me anywhere. I'm on social media. If I'm not on Selling in a Skirt, I'm on Judy Hoberman. I'm, I'm everywhere. And I also am very consistent. So every morning before 7 a.m. Central, I will have a post up on all social media. And when I don't, people actually text me and ask me if I'm okay. <laughs> oh my god seriously but so if i'm on a different time zone like when i'm in california mm -hmm. and it's two hours earlier i may not get it up by seven central but it's up by seven and so people you know i'll say well you know i'm in california and they're like oh okay um so people uh, you know but i am very consistent and somebody asked me if i change my analytics now i'm not a tech person so i said well, if you tell me how to do it, I will do it because I probably am doing something wrong. They're going, no, no, no. I see your stuff first thing every single morning. I thought maybe you changed something. Well, it's because I'm very consistent. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. So do things that make you consistent, that makes you stand out. You know, I mean, that's really what that's, you know, this whole thing is about standing out and having relationships and, and taking the spotlight off you and, and really concentrating on your people yeah. and know your, know your people. 100%. When you say it's not about you, that is a good thing that it's not about me. Oh, if we can take that, that pressure out, that's awesome. I yeah. like that. So all of this information you guys can find on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. And the first one, Judy, is what's the most transformational book you have ever read? Oh, I've read a lot of transformational books, but I will tell you recently, the book that has really changed things for me is Powerful Questions. Mm. Powerful, yeah, it's by Andrew Sobel, S-O-B-E-L. And, and because I've been labeled the question queen, I thought it would be a good book for me to read. And there's one question, actually, there's a few questions, but one question in there, and this is good for everybody. I've used it a few times and the conversation changes drastically. The question is, what do you still want to accomplish? And that's at the end of your conversation. You may not have sold anything. You may not have gotten you know, into their company unit, whatever it is. And I always say, What's the, what do you still want to accomplish? And the CEOs of companies take a deep breath. Mm. They have all said to me, no one's ever asked me that question before. And 10 or 15 minutes later, they're still talking about things they want to accomplish. So to me, very transformational. Very. Awesome. I'll add that to my list. <laughs> For sure. Uh, the second question is, what's the most powerful routine you do to create a financially free and balanced life? Uh, so the routine that I do is I have my three R's. It's review, readjust, release. And I do this every quarter. And so the first thing that I do is I review everything that I did for that quarter. Mm -hmm. What worked, what didn't work. Then I will, you know, I will re review it. I'll readjust it. So if it's something that I still want to continue, then I readjust. Maybe it's the wrong audience. Maybe it's the wrong message, whatever it is. The hardest one is the release part because I have to let go of things. And the first time I had to release something, I really thought that was it. I can't, I mean, what am I going to do? How am I? Mm, no, review, readjust, release. And I do it every single quarter. And you'll find that you become much more um, in tune with what you're supposed to be doing and you're doing revenue generating activities as opposed to, I'm just doing a lot of activities. Mm. So the release part is something that didn't work or it's no longer your goal, part of your goal? Well, it, it's usually something that I've, I've already readjusted a number of times. It's just not either, not that it's not my goal anymore, but it's not what somebody needs. Mm. I thought there was a problem there, but I was inventing a problem. Mm. right so again comes down to it's not about you is that about, yeah. yeah yeah the last question is which woman famous or not has inspired you the most so my book walking on the glass floor is dedicated to my grandmother and my grandmother i call her the fashionista because mm -hmm. she was very fashionable head to toe and she also was a feminist and she was born in the 1890s. She's no longer alive. Um, but she always told me that I could do anything I wanted to do. And she was there to support me when, um, in, when my, my mom did, but she was not as strong as my grandmother. And my father totally did not. Mm. You know, my, my father told me that all I was was pretty and I'd never amount to anything else. So when you have that in your home every day, but then you have this very strong woman saying, oh yeah, you could do anything you want. What do you need to do? Let's do it. So, yeah. Wow. 
Love it. Um, Judy, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for, thank you for the stand you're taking too and in, in the work you're up to. It's very, you're very passionate about it. You're very knowledgeable about it. And I just love, because, love it because you're, you're empowering women across the board. So that's just super, super cool and very aligned with what we're up to too. So thank you. And thank you um, for having me. Thank you, Judy. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was awesome. Really awesome. And whatever I could do to support you and your um, listeners, please let me know. That's what I do. We appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.